Thank you guys for coming. Welcome to, I believe this is the fifth meeting about parking relating to Central Hill Campus, AKA Somerville High School and City Hall and the library. Um, for those who you haven't uh, met me before, I think I see a lot of familiar faces here, but I'm Mike Tremblay. I'm the Senior Transportation Planner for the City of Somerville. Uh, I work on the third floor of City Hall uh, up at OSPCD. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, Mary Jo Rossetti, Alderman at Large is here, as well as Ward 3 Alderman Ben Ewan Campen. Um, Ben Ewan Campen, as well as a few other people in this room have helped out in a w working group um, that, we, that meets, uh, I guess, relatively as frequently as these meetings, if not a little bit more frequently. Um, and Alderman Rossetti has been um, you know, a, a concerned advocate of this issue since the beginning. So um, they're, you know, they're usually at these meetings if they, if they don't have anywhere else to be uh, at Port and City Business. So um, just letting you know they're here. Um, so I wanted to give you guys an update on where we are with the, um, the parking situation around the high school. As you know, uh, let me go through the agenda now. Um, I'm going to go through the, park, the project uh, timeline again uh, for those who are uh, unfamiliar with the project itself or uh, are curious how things are going. Um, I'm going to get into the recap of the uh, data we collected this year. We had a meeting in September, but the date changed and the location changed, and the, as a result, there weren't a whole lot of attendees. So I want to—I know that a lot of people who are interested probably didn't get to see that data. That presentation in, in its entirety is on the website. Um, if you go to, you know, Somerville Traffic and Parking and click through the, the Central Park Hill Campus Parking link, um, that's on there as well. Uh, it's also somervillema.gov/slash/slash/shsparking. Um, if you can't find it, just email transportation at sarvalami.gov, you'll get me. Um, but you can get, see that presentation in its entirety. Um, so I'll go through that, the highlights of that. Um, I'm going to go through the resident survey results, which are still, we're still collecting data from that. This, we're not closing the survey until we feel like no one's answering it anymore. Um, I'm going to go through some of the preliminary staff survey results, which we, um, we released, I think, last week or the week before. Um, and we're still trying to get a few more responses for, but, but uh, we also need to parse the data a bit more. Uh, so we'll go through some preliminary results for that. Um, talk to you about some of the parking mitigation that we're likely going to go forward with in 2019, and then some of the next steps. Um, and I do have a, um, for those who have to leave, I have a tentative meeting date of March 11th, which is a Monday. Uh, so about three weeks from today, or three weeks from yesterday, that is. So, uh, yep. Sorry, not three weeks. <laughs> I will not be here in three weeks. Uh, <laughs> or it'll be likely, that's New Year's Day or something like that. So, um, yeah, three months from, uh, from yesterday will be the next meeting, um, and we'll talk about where we are then. So, um, for those who haven't seen this diagram before, uh, it's a timeline of the project uh, as we are in today. We, uh, in 2018, I guess around June of this, of this year, we, uh, well, December of this, uh, of, of this, this past year, we, we, we started the process of removing the, uh, the concourse for the, for the modular classrooms that you see out there today. Um, a bulk of those spaces were removed around April or May of this year. Um, coming next June, which will be you know, six months or so from now, um, plus or minus, I'm not sure if that's still on track, uh, there'll be a, a pretty significant reduction in spaces because that's where the bulk of the high school's going, uh, right in that rightmost blue square there. Uh, so that'll be taken offline in June or thereabouts next year. And then uh, around the same time in 2020, the school street lot will come offline. My understanding is that most of the school will be reopened by then, and that will be, that's the field work, the, the, the playing fields that'll be, hap that'll be built there. So um, much of the impact will be felt around that time in, the, in 2020. Um, that may also correspond with, correspond with some of the spaces in the June 2019 area be coming back offline, you know, some small number, you know, a dozen or so spaces coming back offline there. So the impact there might be closer to 25 or 30 spaces in that time. Um, so this past year, we issued permits to city staff, uh, city hall staff particularly, to be able to park on uh, residential streets in the area. Um, we will most likely be doing that with teachers coming in September. So for the residents in the room, that's, you know, what will concern you the most as well as teachers will, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you know, that's been communicated to you, but that'll likely be the, uh, the course of action going forward. So the parking study, uh, we got, we did a parking study, it was a bit of a history. Uh, we did a parking study in 2017 with a consultant called Nelson Nygaard. Uh, the parking data collection was some, somewhere around late May, early June of 2017. So there were some questions about what about seniors who drive to school? They're out of school around May 25th, so that wouldn't have been captured. Um, there were also some questions about what happens in that volatile period when teachers are arriving to campus, but residents haven't left yet between, like, you know, between 7 a.m. and 8.30 a.m., um, so we wanted to get some more data on that. 
Um, what about evening events? You know, there's events nearly every night, uh, either at City Hall and or the high school. Um, residents have come home, but there are people on campus for those events. What happens then? Can residents get to their houses? Um, defining what's considered to be a space. So uh, we wanted to make sure that um, we, we had a pretty good representation of how many spaces were on each street, um, even if people don't park so efficiently, right? So if you, have a, if you can imagine a, a, a gap between two driveways that's 30 feet or so, you can probably squeeze two cars in there, but if someone takes up most of, the, most of that area, you're not gonna get two cars in there. So we wanted to be as conservative there as possible and assume that people are not parking efficiently so that if people do park efficiently, there's more space. Um, so we wanted that baseline condition that assumed people were not parking efficiently. And then um, snow counts, which have yet to happen um, any day now, knock on wood, hopefully not too soon, but uh, we, we have our consultant uh, ready to go. Uh, I think we have a two, day, a two days after a snow emergency and a three day period after a snow emergency to more, co more count the number of spaces that are actually available. Not, not less so the number of people parked, but the number of people, number of spaces that are available because the number of spaces go that the snow takes up is significant, right? So you wanna make sure you know what that supply is, how that supply changes from the summer when there's no debris on the street to the winter when maybe ha up to half of the spaces are, are blocked by snow. So uh, going through some of the data, like I said, all of this is available on the website. Uh, I, I don't have time to go through the whole, the whole, study, uh, the whole study area, the whole traffic study, uh, parking study now because it would take up the whole two hours probably. And a, this is a consultant study, so I'd, I, I am not averse to, uh, to re reciting the whole thing. But I wanted to go through what the highest uh, kind of existing demand condition uh, for each period that we collected, a.m., midday, and p.m. Uh, so we, what happened was they collected, I think, four or five different uh, weekdays, and then they looked at each of those weekday study periods. So weekday number one, a.m., weekday number one, one p.m., weekday number one, one, midday, and they, they kind of took the worst day of those, of those four collection days, and then they, they, you know, that's what's shown up here. So this was the day that had the most uh, parking, uh, parking demand out of the four days they collected. And as you can see, um, uh, quite a few streets are in that yellow zone, which is between 50% and 85% full. This is sort of the sweet zone. If, if, if it's less empty, if it's more empty than that, that means you know, uh, th there's, uh, there's a lot of parking supply out there, which is probably unrealistic. Um, there's some of those green zones in there. Uh, a lot of them are on you know, things like Medford Street, where there was you know, construction vehicles and things like that. Uh, but a lot of the streets are in that you know, goldenrod, uh, yellow, or orange zone. The orange zone is that 85% to 100% full, which is probably pretty typical. And then you see these red zones where things were measured to be over full. So this is a, this is a result of vehicles parking, very, uh, motorists parking very efficiently. So we counted something, you know, say we counted 25 spaces if people did not park efficiently, and we, then we counted 28 cars, it means people were parked very close together, there's real, probably really nowhere to park on that street if it's red. Yes. So, so what does, uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand, the, the, on Highland Avenue it looks like it's green the whole way, pretty much. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? Does it mean that the, we, people are good at parking close together, or does it mean that there yeah. are tons of It means that there are a lot of spaces. Um, Highland Ave is tricky because there is street sweeping once a week. So it's possible that on the south side of Highland Ave, that whatever day that they collected sh that showed the most demand on an Oxford Street or a Putnam Ave, that may have been a street sweeping day on Highland Ave, which is why cars are parked in the neighborhood more, because they couldn't park overnight on Highland Ave. So you're going to get some of those ano anomalies, if that, if that makes sense. Um, but on the, on the north side of Highland Ave, it does show that things are pretty full, if that makes sense. So that, that, to, that to me suggests that this was a street sweeping day. So, so Highland Avenue is like full. Every day, sure. all day, yeah. pretty much. Mm -hmm. And is this showing that it's? This is showing. Yeah, yeah. So, so overnight. So on arterials, street sweeping happens overnight. So cars arrive, start arriving in the morning, but overnight that side of the street may have been empty. If you look at the midday period, things start filling up, which should hopefully make sense, right? So, um, you know, I would look on the Highland Ave. In this case, I would look at not only the north side of the street, which is showing that it's pretty full but also the neighborhood around it, because if you usually park on Highland Ave and you can't, you're probably gonna park on Putnam Street or Oxford Street, which is showing pretty full, so. Mike, is this data, when was this data done that you're Sorry, showing yeah. us now? Yes, uh, thank you, Mary Jo. Um, this data was collected in uh, early May, uh, early to mid-May of, uh, of 2018. Which, I just wanna remind you that I made a real 
strong stink about that because their morning check was 9 a.m. and teachers arrive at 6, 6.30. So they weren't collecting the right morning data so, for a majority of the at least employees. Sorry, uh, my understanding is that this data was collected before 7 a.m. This particular data, the, the 2017 study was, yeah, they were collecting up to 9 a.m. All right, so this was this a correction collected. of that? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, but the worst possible time out of those four days collected data, 75% of the spots were not taken on Highland Avenue. So I want to reiterate that this is, if you took all of the, this is the day that the most, most number of cars were parked in this whole area, which happened to be a day that Highland was being swept. So if you took a different one of those days, you might see more cars parked on Highland Ave, but perhaps less on the, on the side streets. So we, we understand that Highland Ave is mostly full, but when the streets are being overnight, when they arrive to, to count cars, there's not going to be a whole lot of cars parked there yet. Uh, but they're, you know, Oxford Street is bright red, right? So I'm guessing that people just park the next street over. Um, I, uh, our data shows that Oxford Street is generally pretty full all the time anyway, right? So um, it, it's important to kind of understand that, you know, we, we collected on different days. We collected on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and a Friday, I believe. I think we collected on two different Tuesdays because that's the day that no street sweeping hap is happening. But this is the day we found that most cars are parked on the street just because of day-to-day -day fluctuations. Uh, was this before the permits were issued to uh, city staff and faculty? No. So this, so this data was collected in May of this year, which was um, when after the first batch, after the first batch of um, the, the, the 2018 61 spaces in the concourse had gone away, uh, unlike last year's study, which was before anything of any of this happened. So. This shows a, a state where um, some of the parking had already gone away, some uh, staff's already parking in the neighborhoods, but in this condition, most city staff had not arrived yet. Teachers had probably started arriving at this point. So this is the midday condition. As you can see, um, there's a, a bit more green because residents have left and gone to work, but there's also different streets that are showing up yellow or orange or red. Uh, in particular, Highland Ave is starting to fill up. Um, Montrose Street is Full because that's where a lot of the city staff parks. Uh, Madison Street is similar, um, and then a, a lot of the neighborhood streets are just generally in a state of, of um, you know, there might be a few spaces available, but not, not, not wide open. Um, so this is the midday condition. This is generally the least demand you see because um, residents have gone and, and city staff again. It, city, teachers have not yet started parking on the streets. In, for, for the most part, I know that some have to. But um, for, for now, this midday condition is, the le is generally the least strained period. Full street parking lot? Yes. But not the other lot? The, the, other, the other lots are, are counted. All those orange lines oh, those are, are those lots. So you'll, in the lots, you'll see that most spaces, most of the lines in the lots are in that orange because if they're completely full, they show up at 1.0, which is the orange line. Um, the school street lot that somebody must have squeezed in a space that wasn't actually a space, and so there's one or two extra cars in there. Um, and then if you look at the PM condition, this is generally the, the, worst, the, the, the worst of the three time periods we collected. Um, you know, uh, Prescott Street's full, Putnam Street is pretty much full or, or over full. Madison and Montrose are pretty full. Highland Ave is as full as you'd expect it to be, right? Um, so it, the, neighbor, the residents are coming home. Perhaps city, city staff has not quite left yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, no, no, this particular night, I believe, was a tip, was a was a I'd say a typical evening event, board of aldermen meeting. Um, but it, 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 yeah, uh, there may have been a, 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 a I think there was a play or something like that. Um, end of yeah. I'll talk about like the perfect storm night, which is like parent teacher night this or, not, or uh, parents night later this year. Or later this evening, um, but this is a typical night that you'd see, you know, once a week or twice a week, um, as opposed to once a year or twice a year. What time would that be? This was collected, um, this would have been collected starting at 6 p.m., so between 6 and 8 p.m. So residents have started arriving, but we didn't want to wait till too late because I know I, I, sometimes I don't leave until 6.30, um, you know, or I, I'm in a meeting right now, right? So um, people do stay at City Hall a bit later if there is a Board of Aldermen meeting or a committee meeting. Um, people are hanging out there, so we wouldn't want to do it at like 10 o'clock at night because none of those people would be there anymore. This is a you know a, a dinner time count, if you will. Um, so then we wanted to look at the uh, you know when everything's done, when all the um, when all the lots are uh, the lots that are being removed are removed, um, what things will look like, and, and teachers are parking in the street as well as city staff. So if you'll go back to the midday, uh, sorry, the AM condition, the reminder what that looks like. 
um, here's what it would look like when those teachers and city staff are parking on the streets again. So if you kind of do a back and forth, there are some streets that are more full than others. Um, these lines are not, you know, there's, it's, it, they're not gradual. So you might go from a, a, a light orange to a dark orange, if you will, but you wouldn't see it on this graphic. Um, but, oops, sorry. But generally, you'll see that um, some streets are more full than they were before. Uh, we don't have the numbers on this graphic, which I can ask our consultant to add. But um, again, the morning is before most of the staff arrive, so this is not going to affect, you know, the teachers will start to park in the available spaces on the concourse first and then on the street, sit on the streets, so the things aren't change too, too much in this condition. Is there, is there a reason why on one street, one side of the street would be heavily full or parked mm -hmm. and the other side of the street wouldn't be? Like, I'm looking at School Street. Yes, so it's similar to Highland Ave. I believe school streets swept in the same days as Highland Ave. Medford Street is different, uh, but if, if uh, on, on Monday nights or Monday mornings, yeah, school streets swept. So, yeah. yeah. And the, everybody and crams on the other. So, like, yeah, yeah I'm, on, I'm on Summit, where you can see it's vacant on one side. And yeah. Summit is like, squeezed in. Summit is this one? Uh, I think the next one. one. Yeah. It's one of those. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, all those streets have one side or the other. So, if you see a green line on one side and a red line on another, it's likely a street sweeping. Uh, condition because people don't park like that <laughs> if right. they can help it right. so um, but uh, overnight that's when you see that kind of stuff during the day uh, afternoon there's not sweet, sweet sweeping until the next morning so uh, you know noon time and evening is when you, you you can probably not take into account street sweeping as much and um, so it's just vehicles parked it doesn't matter if they're construction or whether they're just right we didn't well we parsed out uh, I don't have that in this presentation we did count permits um, for uh, each of those periods so if you have a resident permit if you have a one of the permits we give to city staff um, some a, a, a school department permit things like that uh, guest permits we counted as well so um, we do have that data uh, or if you don't have a permit um, but we don't we don't have specific vehicle types if we noticed construction vehicles things like that one thing I will say is if it, we counted, this is not just vehicles parked, it's spaces occupied, if you will. So if there's a dumpster parked, or a dumpster placed in a parking space, we counted both of those spaces as full, okay. right? Because people can't park there. So um, we wanted to make sure that we got an accurate, uh, and we actually noted that down when we could, is uh, it, you know, there was a dumpster in this space or, or, or whatnot, uh, or a you know, moving truck was here and parked there all day or whatever. So um, that's the kind of stuff we tried to get. So looking at midday, Again, things are pretty full um, in, in some cases and in, in some availability in others. But if you go to the future condition, you start to see a lot more orange and red. So what the consultant did in this case is they assumed that uh, vehicles associated with City Hall, with the high school, with the library, would be pretty much assigned to a street that had availability. In reality, it's probably not going to work like that. It's gonna, they're going to go to the, the closest available street, which puts more strain on the people that live closer to the top of the hill or on a street that's closer to the campus. But um, you, because we didn't want to assume that people would double park or park in front of driveways or things like that, they were assigned to streets that had availability. So it's a bit tough to see on this screen, but you can see kind of the contrast. Madison and Montrose are, f are, are filled up to that 85% level. Um, sorry, I'm going between midday here. Um, Putnam and Prescott and Vinyl, are, are they, they get assigned cars as well. Um, so you can see that this is the kind of the view that would show the most impact of the city staff and school staff parking in the neighborhood. So I can linger that there. And then finally, when you add those, when you add the people that are left over to the PM condition, which is the toughest condition today, you'll see probably the most red and orange lines there. So the most, um, the most constrained condition would be during that Again, this is a typical event night uh, with a Board of Aldermen meeting and a, uh, you know, a significant but not the biggest event at the high school. Um, you know, Prescott's full, Putnam's full, Myas and Montrose are pretty much full, uh, Highland Ave is, is pretty full. Um, all, the lot, all the lot space that we project would re remain would be, you know, as utilized as possible. So um, this is the exercise we did, obviously. That's, that's like a, a normal weeknight, basically. Yeah, yeah. So not 
not a Friday night when nothing's going on, but a you know Tuesday night where you have a committee meeting and um, you know there's there's something going on at the high school and there are people around. And what time would that be? This would be uh, dinner time, you know, oh. at, right about now. So actually, some people might not be back from work yet. Sure. Yeah. So it's kind of finding that uh, the counts can't be done instantaneously, so you do a count over the course of a couple hours. It might start at 5:30 and end at 7:30 or something like that. But what you see here is that we didn't assign people to Avon Street because you're not going to park that far away if you can help it. So we tried to mimic that behavior as much as possible. Um, you know, try not to assume people are going to walk, um, you know, 12 minutes when they can walk five minutes, if you will. So just this is assuming the number of spaces uh, cut out. Yes. So it assumes uh, so these projected space removals. Uh, those future conditions assume that all of these are gone. Yeah. So I didn't. I there are slides that I didn't show that show that intermediate condition, which is July of this year or the September of this year. Um, it's basically, as you can imagine, somewhere in the middle. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, I left those out. So, yes. What is that purple square in front of what is now the atrium? It says parking uh, phase two A parking reallocation. Yeah. So that's so when the high school reopens, there will be some parking that goes back in this area. It's not going to be as much as today. It's going to be 20-ish spaces. I believe that that is set in stone as about that number, a dozen or so, a dozen, two dozen spaces or so. Um, but because those spaces are going to be there and they're probably going to be used for something, we assume that they would be full um, during these kinds of uh, nights. Was that on the, uh, I know there were other plans sent out for like a choice of uh, concourse, like the report, like green spaces, yeah. was that on that concourse? Space? So, my understanding of so that's what you're referring to is the Central Hill campus planning study. Um, so, it's kind of this weird amalgamation of different plans. The high school and the high school campus is its own set in stone plan, and I believe that that's set, like the construction plans are done. It was, you know, the funding was secured, so not a whole lot can change. What you're referring to is the um, if I can find a better graphic, is the west side of, uh, of campus, which is essentially, you know, uh, it includes the monuments, but then it cuts up and then includes the 1850, 1895 building, and uh, it excludes the field, but basically covers all the buildings and land on campus that is not covered by the high school. So what you are talking about is mostly what this lot looks like, which is still um, we're still trying to figure that out. We, we assume that there'll be some number of, you know, uh, 30 or so spaces in there, but that number could fluctuate. Um, I'm, as soon as we know, <laughs> I will apply that. I'll have a consultant apply that to the to the parking study. But I'm not expecting it to be zero. I'm not expecting it to be 100. It'll be somewhere in that few dozen range. So the above 40 spaces altogether on site. Um, if you count the library lot, which is the one on the far right, um, and the spaces in front of the high school that will remain, and the faces in front of City Hall that will remain, I believe it's about 80 to 85 spaces that will remain. And we're losing 150? Correct. One other thing we were asked to do was collect that, uh, that fluctuating period where everybody's either arriving or leaving, uh, which is between 7 a.m. and 8.30. So what we did is, in the interest of not spending you know, tons of time and money trying to collect the whole study area, knowing that this area would likely be the most in-demand area. Um, we collected these streets every half hour, um, a couple times, I believe, uh, in order to figure out just how much things are changing over, that, over the course of that time. So uh, obviously you can't continuously count a street, you know, you can't get a, a, a continuous, you know, view of, you know, a car, two cars arrived at 7.03 and then one left at 7.04. Um, you still have to have that half hour snapshot, but it's a much more um, a zoomed in or uh, a much more specific a, a time frame than a, than a three hour snapshot. As, you know, it's an hour, a half hour snapshot, if you will. So what we found is that while people might be coming and going, uh, things generally just tended to fill up a bit more on those segments um, from 7.30 to 7.00 to 8 o'clock to 8.30. Um, so yeah. As city staff arrived, as teachers arrived, the, the rate of arrival was pretty much consistently higher than the rate of departure, if that makes sense. Um, so this shows you know, the number of people parked on those segments of streets going up, which is interesting because 
if you remember those maps I just showed you, the difference between AM and midday showed that, that the actual, the study area had fewer cars, but those specific streets had more, if that, which tends to make sense if, the, if it's city hall staff parking, so. Um, does that make sense to folks? Another thing we wanted to collect was kind of, we, we mentioned the typical event night, but what about the, the uh, once or twice a year, you know, everybody's on campus for, uh, for SHS parents night. This is where we have some issues, and this is, this is part, this is collected in September of this past year. So again, the concourse lot was, it was offline as it is right now. Um, and we found that cars were parked very close together. Every space, we, every space on the campus was full and most of the spaces in, the, in that same rapid collection area were full. So you probably had some parents that were park, their parts out of this area trying to walk up the hill uh, with, 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 with kids and stuff. So this, as um, Lisa and the rest of the working group has mentioned to me, is a sort of a separate issue than um, the day-to-day, -day, nine to five kind of um, you know, fluctuations. The evening events when everybody's back at home uh, is something we need to figure out. And it's probably a separate solution than the day-to-day -day stuff. Um, so we need to get to work on that. And um, it will, it, it'll be interesting to, to see what that looks like. I know um, there's certain, there's, there's obviously a couple of bus routes that serve the high school, but if, you're lugging, if you have four kids, then it's kind of tough to, to do that. So. Um, we might have to figure out of you know some sort of a valet or a shuttle system there, but the one on the left is the same night as the uh, study area showed. So a typical night is. Weren't your highest, highest numbers were at the peak time when you did the PM study? Those were the highest numbers were the highest occupancy. Now you're saying 51 percent here on the slide where you did PM. Mm -hmm. Those were, the, those were the highest. So I think what happened is, so first of all, this was a, this is a different night than what's counted uh, in this condition. It was the September night versus a May. And I think what happened at the 5.30 time was City Hall staff was started to leave, but the parents hadn't started to arrive for the event yet. Um, but, it, or, or for example, you know, for that, for that play or, or that concert, um, you know, so, so city, city staff starts to leave at 5.30 or 4.30 really. But then people start to arrive around 6.30 for that concert, then that's why it shows a little bit of a blip there. It's hard when you're not comparing apples and apples. Uh, yeah, and, and that's something. It's hard to make sense of the data because yeah. one time you're saying that the nighttime is the highest number, and then on this one it says 50%, 60%. Well, so I, I do want to stress that for a, you know, for a study area wide snapshot, you know, a, a, a occupancy of 70% means that certain streets are full and certain streets have 50% occupancy. So your street, Deb, is probably 50, you know, 90% full, even though this shows that the study area as a whole is only 70% full during that time. So um, you know, a, a different street would, would be more, more, uh, more, more available. Um, so that's something that I'm trying to get across to. Area, yes, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's something I'm trying to make sure people understand is that, bye, um, is that just because overall, uh, and I have these kind of tables here. Um, so the, you know, this is sort of a summary of what I just told you. Um, morning, midday, evening, in terms of overall occupancy of the study area. In the morning, the study area right now is 70% full, which doesn't, it sounds like there's plenty of spaces, but it looks like this, right? There's certain streets that are full and certain streets that have availability. So as you get, as you closer to 75% or 80%, there's gonna be more of those red uh, areas. So just because it says 70% over the course of the study area doesn't mean that your street is gonna be, you know, have three, three out of 10 spaces available. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out is that I mentioned the evening event, which is once a year or twice a year, but um, street sweeping days is the other big, as, as the residents know in this room and, and the people that park on the street, street sweeping days are the really, really tough time to park in the, in the neighborhood. Um, so generally in all three conditions, we will have availability on a typical day but if there's street sweeping between 8 and 12 in either of the two zones, that's when we have pretty significant issues. So um, I, I do want to, that, that's sort of the conclusion of the study for me is that uh, it, regardless of all the other, you know, the, there's mobility issues for teachers, we have, for teachers and staff we have to worry about, we have to worry about evening events, but the data, the, you know, the thing that most people will have to worry about is what happens on street sweeping days. And that's where we really need to drive behavior change, people that, can get to get to work without driving. We need to get them to do that. Um, we need to be able to provide um, you know other al alternatives for folks, especially on those days. And if we're going to do it on those days, we may as well do it 
all the time. So, do you have a question? Yeah, and I have that. I have that as well. So, um, it pretty much. Uh, so you can imagine a, for a week after a heavy snowstorm, it's going to look like a street sweeping day continuously, right? Because one side of the street is going to pretty much be un, uh, unavailable for parking. So we understand that as well. And um, and that's also the time of that's also the time you don't necessarily want to walk on the sidewalks because they're slippery or it's dark out all the time, um, and it's low visibility. So, right. So. Those are all things we understand, and they're 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 sort of um, they're they're uh, issues that are seasonal or they're you know once a week or as, as opposed to constant. But we we understand that those are the things we need to solve for. So conclusions. Parking will uh, note the italics here. Parking will remain generally available on typical weekdays, and I should have added on certain streets because certain streets will generally be full most of the time. Uh, I did that, that. So um, some streets are in very high demand, um, and as, par as campus parking is reduced, the availability on the streets that are not currently in very high demand will creep up, potentially up to those, up to those levels in certain cases. So we have to understand that things are tricky for a lot of people now, and it's going to be, you know, the, the number of people are, is going to, you know, it's going to creep up to that level uh, for other folks as well uh, as we take away more parking. Um, the parking challenges persist during particular times and days, as I mentioned. Uh, so street sweeping is four times a month on every street, um, and that's nine months a year, of which seven of those is during the school year. So there is a little bit of relief, but that's when the snow happens. So um, we, we have to understand that. Snow emergencies, um, it's not so much the days the schools are closed, because that's not as much of an issue as the days, the, the two or three days afterwards, which is why we're study, which is why we're having a consultant study those days when the schools are reopened, but those parking spaces are still just not available yet. And then the evening events, which I talked about. So any questions on that study? There's kind of a lot. Um, I'm happy to talk about it more offline with folks if they, if they want to, but I can share that presentation um, if, you, if you want. So let me just grab some water here. This will all be posted online? Yes. Yes, Alderman, sorry. I realized that uh, after our meeting on Monday that the last meeting hadn't been posted yet. It's now posted there. So. All right, survey data. So thank you for the residents. I believe that's most of you who did, who did fill out that, re, uh, that resident survey. If you haven't, the website is there. Make sure you put in the capital letters for SHS because some other SHS somewhere else did the same survey with a similar link and it gets you to a different link entirely, which I didn't realize at the time. So, um, but if you type in the URL correctly, you should get there. Um, if you go to the wrong URL, it should become apparent very quickly because it talks about parking garages and stuff, which we don't have. So. Um, we got 177 valid responses, which I count valid as pretty much anybody who lives in any of these streets. Um, some, people, some people submitted responses from like Willow App and stuff, so I took those out. Um, but 177 responses, the, the survey is still open, so if you haven't taken it yet, please do. If you have neighbors um, or friends in the area uh, that haven't taken it yet, please have them do so. We're doing it per household, so don't have your spouse or your, your, your kid or whoever uh, do it if you've already done it, um, just because we want to understand the, the household's parking needs. So we asked all those questions, which I'll get into. Um, we wanted to try and get a, a handle on um, whether how many cars you have, where you park them, do you have a driveway, and, um, and uh, how, how often do you use your visitor pass and things like that. So sorry for the large swath of information here, but I wanted to compare um, the overall study area versus what essentially is the rapid collection area plus a few extra streets, the streets that are already pretty full these days. So uh, I have a list in the bottom if you, if you do look up looking at the presentation uh, later, but it is Putnam, Prescott, Madison, Montrose, uh, Highland Ave, um, you know, Oxford Street, Pre uh, Vinyl Ave, things like that, the streets that you would imagine that most city staff would park on. Uh, and I wanted to compare, you know, how those, how those parking behaviors worked out. Um, so one thing I, I did note is that um, driveway access kind of fluctuated depending on where you were. Um, so in the, in the kind of high demand area, more people had no access to a driveway, but also more people had access to multiple spaces in their driveway. And I think this probably has to do with the fact that there's a lot of multi-car driveways on, on uh, Prescott and on Putnam and Vinyl. There's also larger apartment buildings there where you 
you know, large numbers of people don't have access to a parking uh, space in a driveway. So that's pretty interesting to me. Um, I also wanted to note that people in those areas tended to report that they had to park further away than they considered reasonable than the study area as a whole. So that was interesting to me as well. Um, but in general, uh, I can let you, you know, sift through this yourself, but um, it, we, we, there, there was a significant number of people that, um, you know, 30, about, about 30 people had a, had a driveway that they had access to and 30 people had no, um, no access at all. So, uh, or sorry, 30 people had like two parking spaces in a driveway. So uh, pretty interesting stuff there. We look forward to, to diving into a bit more. Any questions? So Right, so we, we wanted to, we, we, one question we wanted to dig into is, if you have a driveway and you go to work from nine to five every day and you would be willing to give up your, you know, to, to rent your space out to, a, to a, a teacher, would you want to if you were even able to? So we had, no, I don't have a driveway at all. I have a driveway, but I don't want to do it. Um, or I don't want to, uh, or, I don't have authority to give my driveway. I, I rent, basically. Um, I don't have the authority to, to rent on my driveway space because it's my landlord's driveway, right? So that's sort of an explanation of that. Um, I also asked the, serve the snow emergency que uh, question because as some folks, hopefully everybody knows at this point, but um, they are not going to be allowing parking in city or in school lots this year um, in during snow emergencies because what ends up happening is if it snows overnight, stops at 5 a.m., they could clear out the driveways and get school started that day, but if the cars are parked in the, in the, in the school lots, they can't open school that day. So my understanding is that it's, it's sort of a test this year. They have gates they can open or close. Um, I imagine they'll try it for a few snowstorms and reevaluate, re but I wanted to see the impact of that on residents. So does that mean if, it, as you say, if it snows overnight, if there's no parking in the lots for teachers, they don't open the schools? because the snow hasn't been removed? That's my understanding, although there might be another reason. Uh, they might not want... I, I, I can see their logic there. Um, but I, there, it might have something to do with the, the, the idea of people entering school property during school hours that shouldn't be there. Um, that's a little bit above my head there. But uh, So uh, you can imagine an elementary school, you have a bunch of people that are sure. entering a parking lot during school hours or whatnot. So. And that applies citywide, not just the high school. So you're talking about yeah. all seven wards as opposed to just this one. So well, to be clear, the, the the reason that the administration gave for changing the policy was the reason that you gave first, which is that the superintendent should be able to make the decisions about opening the school based on uh, whether it's okay to open the schools, not based on are people parked in their lots. Right. That, exactly. That's, that that's is the that's reason my that point they gave. exactly. Okay. So. Okay. So the, the staff survey is another one that we put out. We put this out a couple weeks ago, um, and we sent it out to everybody who works even part-time at uh, either City Hall or the high school or the library. So if you work, I, I work at City Hall all day, but you can imagine that some people come from DBW and, and come to a couple meetings and leave. So we wanted to make sure we got those people because those people have to park as well. Um, so we uh, got 220 responses, about 50-50 between city employee and school employees. Um, we want to break those apart because we imagine how the, 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 the ways we try and d encourage people to, to change their behavior might be different for a teacher versus a city staff. Um, we know that teachers need to lug things to their classroom sometimes. They have, um, you know, some, some high school staff bounce around to different schools throughout the day. You can imagine a, 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 some sort of an, a guidance counselor or an administrator might have to go over to the Brown School and then up to West, West Somerville Neighborhood School and over to the East before coming back to the high school. So those are the kinds of things we want to dig into. Uh, but the treatments for those people might be different for a full-time City Hall staff person who arrives at 8.30 and leaves at 4.30 as opposed to a, a teacher's uh, hour. So we did note that 81% of people exclusively or usually drive, which is pretty high. Um, it's probably higher than the city. It's, it's actually definitely higher than the city as a whole in terms of residents, uh, even if you break it down by this ward. Um, so I get the, the, good, the good news is that there's a lot of potential for change. The bad news is that there's, that there's a behavior that is kind of set, right? So if 81% of people drive now, it's gonna be, you know, they're gonna expect to drive in the future. So that, that's, that's sort of a double-edged sword there. Um, but 19% arrive, either by, by some other mode most of the time, which is usually walking if you live in this area. 
Um, there's a lot of bus and, and, and cyclists as well, uh, associated with the, high school, the city hall staff. Um, about 40% are what you consider to be pretty local, uh, either Somerville or Medford residents. Uh, after that, it becomes more sparsely spread out throughout the region. Um, most have a commute length of less than a half hour, which is good considering they're driving, but you can imagine how if you have a 20 minute drive today, it might be tough to swallow a 50 minute bus ride or you know an hour and a half uh, of a commuter rail li a ride into North Station and a, and a half hour Green Line ride back out to, to Gilman Square. Uh, once the green line's done, so that's that's some, that's another reason why we're considering like you know, commute time is something that people are it's a quality of life issue, and if you add a bunch of commute time, and then that that's unappealing to people. Um, Eighteen percent reported having some kind of an accessibility issue, so uh, not being able to walk up um, up Central Hill uh, from from Union Square, for example. Um, only two percent of those people had HP placards, which again, we're not. It's not, it's not any kind of a test. We know that people have HP placards for certain reasons, but you, know, you can still have a mobility issue without an HP placard. Uh, and then 46% of people, I'm imagining almost entirely city hall staff, say they can work from home at least occasionally. Teachers can't do that, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> it'd be kind of a trick. But uh, that's something that I want the administration, uh, my, my bosses, to consider, because I know that there's certain days where I woke up in the morning and there's nothing on my calendar and I can get some real work done. Work done. I don't necessarily have to be at the office uh, every, day, every single day. So that won't, be a, that won't be a way to take a bunch of cars out of the, out of the streets, but it might be a way to, to, to ease, uh, lessen the blow a little bit. So we asked the question of what might help reduce your dependency on a personal automobile. And we asked, you know, the Green Line extension's coming, it's happening. It's going to be a, few, a painful couple of years in terms of detours and things like that. But um, we will have a new Green Line station here in a couple of years, which is exciting and has the potential to take certain people off the road if you live on the Green Line. So, um, you know, about 30% of people said they were very likely or somewhat likely to use that over driving. Uh, we also talked about, you know, sh shuttles from Assembly, shuttles from Davis or Porter. Um, if we did provide some parking off-site, but within a 10-minute walk, would you use that? Um, if we subsidized an MBTA pass, would that help? Uh, if we gave you a free bike share membership, would that help? Uh, if we set up a carpool listserv, would that help you? I know certain people have different schedules and you wouldn't be able to use it every day, but if you find out that you, know, you generally have the same hours as somebody else and you live in the same neighborhood, that could be a way to take one out of, one out of two cars off the road in that case. So, I wanted to highlight these two because you know the Green Line extension is coming. It's not something we need to do anything. It's going to happen anyway. But um, that's 29% of people that could choose not to drive in the future. Uh, but then you know the, the purple box is the most popular option, if you will. Uh, most people want most people that responded in some way wanted some kind of dedicated parking facility, even if it is offsite somewhere. So next question was. Which services, if offered, would allow you to change your daily commuting behavior? So not just once a day, once a week, or once a month, but if you drive today, every day, what would make that change? So similar answer here, offsite. Sorry, the, the question specified to campus, so you still drive it just to an off, off, offsite lot. So a similar number said um, driving to an offsite lot. Uh, flexible work hours again probably applies more to city hall staff than teachers, uh, but if you can not worry so much about the bus being late because you're allowed to show up anytime between eight and 10 and leave anytime between four and six, then that might be appealing. Um, shared vehicles on campus for work related use. This is something that actually appeals to me pretty well because I will only drive if I, need to, if I have to be at like three places at once. If I have a meeting at DBW and traffic and parking and back at city hall, it's hard for me to get around by bus if that's the case. So um, that might apply to some other folks as well. So that was the third highest response there. Um, improved sidewalks and pedestrian crossings, certainly. Um, it's a lot easier to get around if you don't have to worry about um, you know, crossing the street and things like that. Showers and changing rooms, 10%. If you bike to work or you want to bike to work but you're worried about what you look like when you get there or how you feel when you get there, that might be, that's something that a lot of um, private developments are doing is providing those uh, amenities for their employees so that you can run to work, you can jog to work, you can ride your bike to work, um, or even walk if it's a long distance. Um, subsidized MBTA pass, like I mentioned. Increased frequency of bus routes. This is something we're working on with the MBTA about the 90 bus, which is like a 45 minute uh, one way trip between um, Davis Square and Wellington. And it stops at three straight orange line stops, which is dumb. <laughs> um, and so we're talking to them about 
either you know making it a straight shot between either Davis and Sullivan or Davis and Assembly, which would cut the one-way time in half. So that would make another bus uh, more frequently along Highland Ave and, and might get, allow more people to rely on the bus a bit more. And then safer bicycle, bicycle routes, um, of course. This Highland Ave is really tricky for bicycling. It's not a fun street to ride on. So if you're crossing or riding on Highland Ave at all, I can see why that would be appealing. Uh, but a lot of these things are either being considered already or are happening already. Uh, so uh, I want to mention that the Homans site at school at Medford Street, um, I believe the last meeting I said it was imminent that it was coming down, but this time I really think I mean it. Um, <laughs> it is uh, 21 spaces or so that's going to be allocated for city use at this corner of school in Medford Street. That's the old, uh, the old brick building next to the gas station there. The Green Line is going to be using it most of the site for lay down for the Green Line station, but there is a corner of the area that is contractually ours to use for parking. So that'll be a small relief to the um, to the 89 spaces or so that are going away this year. Uh, 21 or so come will will be replaced there at least for a few years. Short yeah. Yeah. So the question was was it was short term or not? Uh, the idea for the future is that that gets developed as part of a transit oriented development because that's a, all of a sudden a prime lot for you know next to the Green Line. So. Um, that site could potentially have parking underneath it. It's actually a, a pretty favorable shape for parking underneath it, in which case we would try and get a deal with them to try and get some daytime parking uh, if it's a residential building that has mostly an overnight use. Uh, but that's a ways away. We don't have any plans for that yet. Um, flexible work hours, I think that's something we can, what we, city hall staff, some, certain city hall staff sort of already do this, um, but um, obviously that doesn't apply to teachers. Um, shared vehicles on campus. We are in some, you know, some preliminary discussions about whether that looks like having additional fleet of cars on campus, which again, they that takes up parking spaces, but at least multiple people could use those cars throughout the day. But also, is it possible to have a corporate account with a rideshare service like Uber or Lyft or something else that would not require those spaces to be taken up, but also would allow me to not take an out-of-pocket cost to go to traffic and parking for a couple hours or go to DBW for a couple hours. So. There's obviously some, um, there's some hoops to jump through in terms of budgeting and things like that, but um, that's something we're exploring. Um, improved sidewalks and pedestrian crossings, that's something that's already being planned as part of the campus plan, which I had mentioned earlier. So we are looking into uh, adding additional crossings with high visibility crosswalks along Highland Ave and along School Street. Um, and that would, that would correspond to um, potentially some bump outs and traffic calming measures as well. Um, the engineering department is also prioritizing s uh, sidewalk repairs. So right now, sidewalks are repaired generally when streets are repaved. But you can imagine that means some sidewalks go untreated for a while. So the engineering department is ramping up a way to treat sidewalks without necessarily having to repave a road. Highland Dev is in, in need of both. Uh, so that might, be, uh, that might be the program they use. But uh, that's something that we are expecting will happen around the time that the uh, high school opens. Uh, increased fre frequency of bus routes, as I mentioned, is, is sort of something we're pushing. Uh, we'll know more in January about that. And then the safer bicycle routes, and I guess this goes along with the pedestrian routes as well. The community path is being extended as part of the Green Line extension. So um, if you're coming from West Somerville or even from, um, from the Leachmere area or East Somerville, you'll be able to get to campus via the community path, and that'll be a completely off-road path. So that's a pretty nice, convenient way to, to, to get to campus. So. These things are often a couple years away, or uh, two or three years away in some cases, but. Uh, but still, 90% of the people from the last seven items, 90% said they wouldn't be affected right. by any of these mm -hmm. things. So we're probably going to get to what we're going to do for those 90%. Right. And, the, and, the, and this is, uh, I think the, the bigger thing is what about those evening events? You, you, you're probably less likely to walk or bike to an event that gets out at nine or you have kids that you're toting to the event or things like that. So uh, this might help the day-to-day -day commuter, but I think we, we understand that the, those evening events are especially tricky or the snow emergency um, uh, periods where you're not gonna wanna walk or bike because it's 10 degrees out and there's snow on the ground. Those are things that we, we know we need a different solution for. Um, so. Here's sort of a timeline. Don't hold me to any of these dates, uh, but here's the, here's the time frame I can see these things happening in. Um, so Homan's Lot, uh, I'd say quarter one of, ne of next year uh, in terms of when those spaces would come out online. Um, we want to release a, re uh, a request for proposals for other off-street lots um, in the area. So the way we would need to do that in order to be you know, uh, clean, uh, 
to make sure we gave everybody a fair shot at you know the city's procurement money of a, of an off street lot is basically say, hey everybody, we're looking for an off street lot. Tell us what you have and how much it would cost. And so that's essentially what we, we hope to do um, early next year or get this, that process started this year. Uh, that would hopefully address some of that, you know, the 25 to 30 percent of people that would be willing to park in an off street lot at, rather than parking in the neighborhood. Um, city staff vehicles. I'm hoping that can start to formulate this year probably wouldn't get implemented until next year because there are I imagine there are legal and budgetary issues with, with, with that uh, solution but I'm hoping we can get that get there um, we want to start exploring how much work it would take to enforce assigning staff to certain streets so we, we, one of the big things is if you have one of those mobility impairments that you can walk five minutes or you can walk three minutes but probably not up a hill or uh, or, or whatnot we want to see if there's a way we can equitably give out these permits in a way that um, does not, you know, get, does not give me a permit for Highland Ave right in front of City Hall because I don't need one, but somebody else might, right? So um, having sort of a ring system or a, a tier system that would be a lot harder to enforce for traffic and parking, but if that's what we need to do, we need to explore a way to do that and, and train up traffic and parking to, to make sure they can do that effectively. Um, obviously, we'd need to take street sweeping, street sweeping into account. So if your street's being swept, you probably can't park there that day because there's barely enough spaces for the residents as it is, so you'd probably have an alternate street location that's in a different street sweeping zone. But um, that's something we want to explore more and see how we can implement that before the high school is reopened and before the green line uh, comes online. And then GLX is coming in 2021. So. Which doesn't help. Well, it might, it, 15 or 20 percent of people said that it, it might help. So, um, but it won't help everybody, especially if you live, you know, most teachers don't live in. Somerville or along the Green Line. So um, those folks are coming in from the suburb suburbs a lot of the time, and the Green Line probably won't help them a whole lot. So next steps, um, keep submitting those surveys if you haven't uh, submitted yours yet. Um, we have some more data breakdown to do. A lot of these surveys were, um, you know, I, I collected all this data like this morning. Um, so we're still getting new data thanks to the folks that are um, distributing them. I also did some fresh flyering this week. That's probably why some of you are here. Um, and so why some more people uh, filled out the survey. But we do expect some more of those trickle in, so please do if you, if you haven't yet. Um, I want to evaluate the use of the Homans Building lot. I'm guessing it'll be pretty well used, but it'll be interesting to see if people just prefer to park a little bit closer to City Hall, not to deal with the School Street Hill. Um, so if that, if that lot's not well used, it might inform which parking lots we go after, if we go after any at all. So, um, but again, I'm pretty sure that'll be used pretty well. Um, so emergency data, as I said, Still has to happen. Um, if we get a snowstorm in the next week or two, assuming it's not on the Christmas day, then I'll try and get our consultants out there to count that stuff. Obviously, school vacation we're, we're not going to count during. Um, but uh, if it's a valid school week, uh, then we'll count, it, we'll count those, that data. And then uh, we want to make sure we ad advance those, um, those alternate me me measures of getting people to and from campus, um, especially during those snow emergency, street sweeping, and evening event periods. So. Any questions? They think on the snow day thing, not snow day, but snowstorm. Yeah. There's also the problem of all of these streets are hills. And if you give somebody a non resident parking thing, unless all the sidewalks are cleared also, yeah. they're not going to be able to walk up the hill to the high school. Yeah, that's a good point. We might have to, I mean, it, have to it's more resources and it's. DBW's, as you can imagine, is very busy after right. snowstorms clearing out snow. But if, if this is something that we really want to work, then we'll have to make the sure. The rule is, is how fast you have to clear the sidewalk in front of your house. 24. If you're saying they get to school at 6.30 in the morning. Yeah, it's within 24 hours of, yeah. a, of the end of a snow, snowstorm. Or like, yeah, so. The hills might not be If clean. the school's open because the lots are empty because we don't let people park in the lots, but then we're making people park in the streets, then that could be hill. problematic, right? right. So. Good call. Um, we might have to find some resources to get that, that get those streets cleared out by someone else besides residents. Could you lower ticket rates in those in the high demand areas for residents? Lower ticket rates? <laughs> Temporarily. Like like parking ticket like. Uh huh. <laughs> what what do you think that would accomplish? Just or a just besides aside from making your life a little easier because we're putting yeah. you through the office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Fair point. Um, I don't. I can. I can or like see. Or have a three strikes or something. Right. Um, I mean, things like street sweeping. I know that there, you know, there's reasons why that stuff has to get done, and um, it, we don't want to compromise that. Um, Cambridge does it once a month. 
what street sweeping. sweeping. That's something that I think it, it's not going to solve the whole problem. It's just going to make it less frequent. But I think that's something we can really explore at least for a year. Just don't do these streets every every uh, we every other week. Do it once a month. Um, we'll have to change some signs, but that's not the end of the world. <laughs> um, I'm talking about tickets for parking during streets. Street sweeping day? Yeah, that's that's probably the only time you have to worry about it. That or snow emergencies, which is probably a bigger deal than street sweeping. Yeah, a ticket for no sticker. You know, unless the, the first of each month, they I notice them going around looking to see who's oh, ticker inspections. expired. Mm -hmm. But that's about the only time I've seen them. Yes. How many snowstorms were they going to go out and <clears throat> redo? I think we have I think we have them on on call for two for two different snowstorms for two different days. Um, because one thing, so I, I did some preliminary counts. If you were at either of the last two meetings, um, we did. There was this big snowstorm on like January fourth last year, which was like really cold, and it was like a foot and a half. And we noticed that that snow stuck around for a while, uh, and there was a lot of spaces. Whereas we counted another one in March, and it was a little bit less of an impact. So we, uh, not every snowstorm is created equal. And we know that, um, and so. I think it's, I mean, it's not even snowstorm. It's snowstorm piling upon sure. snowstorm yeah. piling upon yeah. snow. Yeah, I mean, I think we have flexibility. There's some budget that we didn't use uh, because I think we we assumed that they'd be coming to like four meetings, which they didn't necessarily need to do. So uh, I will check to see if we have that budget uh, and make and if if there's a situation where that is happening and who knows. But if there's a situation where it's snowing every Monday, like it was a couple of years ago, then we can we can reassess that every week and see how, how things tend to do this as over time, right? So that's a good suggestion because, again, if you wait for the snow to melt and do it again, you're not going to get much different data, but it's more about the compounding, uh, as, you, as you might see in some years. Ben? Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Mike because he's been, this is an extremely <laughs> Well, I, I, I sympathize with everybody in the room as well because this isn't a fun thing to have to sit through. Decision, that's for sure. uh, but, but that said, I, I do think, you know, when I look at the data, it looks like basically on a regular day, it's going to be really bad. And then any special event, it's going to be beyond really bad to the point of, I don't even know what, you know, people will not be able to park, right? Then street sweeping and snow emergencies. So uh, optimistically, I could certainly imagine there are lots of people who don't show up at these meetings, who didn't take the survey, and honestly, they have access to the driveway. And if it gets bad, they'll be part of it. And there, there is maybe more wiggle room than we're aware of. That's thinking very optimistically. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, I just want to voice the opinion that I've heard from many, many people that the idea of a parking lot just needs to continue to be on the table. And I know right. for those of you who weren't at Resistat, you know, the mayor, he's been, he's very clear about this that it would have cost between twenty and thirty million dollars. Sure. to include a garage. And that, that is absolutely the reason that he has decisively said that's not going to happen for, for the time being. He's, he's not ruling out, you know, you have to ask him, but he said, I'm not ruling out the idea of one at a slightly off, uh, at a location like the home and building. It's not like out of the question, but ideally we would use that land for something more interesting than the parking lot. But push comes to shove, maybe we will wind up in that situation. But kind of that's my understanding of kind of where the, the city is at on this is it, it's unambiguous that this situation would be greatly alleviated by having a parking lot. I don't think we'd be here. Yes. I mean, you might, but. Um, and let me also just add to that. I, I, I do believe that there are some parts of a city, you know, you think of Harvard Square, downtown right. crossing, everybody, you just can't park there. Right. So you don't drive. Well, you have That's to fine. Park. But this is a public high school. <laughs> And the teachers need to park it. This is not like folks coming to town to be tourists. Or, you know, this yeah. is, but are they guaranteed parking? The teachers? Yeah. Was part of their no. agreement? I don't I don't know for sure. I don't think so. But I, I think, honest, I, I'm not exaggerating. I think the fear is that we will lose some teachers. This will be unbearable. And no, I was just concerned legally. I don't believe part so. of their my, union my best recollection, and I might be wrong, is that they're, they're not contractually um, you know, they, they don't contractually obligated to get parking within an X distance or whatnot. That said, we are, you know, that is the worry. Yeah. I can answer that. Yeah, yeah. No. Okay. Thank Sorry. Yes. Uh, th thank you for. <laughs> there you go. I've read the contract too Much more authoritative voice than me on that issue. Thank you. <laughs> but also, there's the issue, and correct me if I'm wrong, but. The, uh, every other, you know, the alternate versus even parking, 
I read somewhere that there are actually more spaces available on the odd side of the streets in Somerville <laughs> as a total than the even side. So that's also going to affect your snowstorm numbers. Because right. this year, which is <clears throat> even side, you're starting off with fewer spaces. Yeah. And, and so there's a few there's a few variations a few variables why I'm interested in this year's data. Last year I did a, I, I did it myself. I did it myself, and it was only a few streets. So this year will be more complete. Um, but it'll also be the first year that we're not permitting residents to park in the lots, which will be a, a worse a worse case scenario than last year. So this will sort of be if you count the even side parking and and the fact that there's no school lots to park in, that, that data will be very interesting to look at, and it'll show a worse condition than I counted last year. Is there only one lot in this? area the uh, school lot that used to provide I, I the coming school is I don't it's not technically a I, I think it's technically a playground but people use it to park I don't know what the, the actual well that yeah I think that may have been for some other yeah for something else I, I I've honestly that's the coming school perplexes me in terms of what it, I know the mayor anticipates it, wants it to be a park someday and I don't disagree but um, for now, I don't know what it's used for. Are they general, using so. it as headquarters for the construction at the high school? They, they have, oh, you're right. There is a there is a field office there now. So that's that might be what I'm thinking of. So maybe once the high school is done, that'll become a park, or that parking lot will become a park. But I know that the coming school is some valuable city space that we've used for emergency purchases in the last year because we had a pipe burst at the annex and things like that. So uh, um, and then yeah. the fire before that, mm -hmm. uh, east on the school. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that my understanding is that I'm, that is not an official school lot at this point. I don't know if people can park there. Uh, it's got a gate. Oh, it does have a gate. So. There was another hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, yes. Thanks. I'm looking at this, and I'm you know I'm thinking about for me, if I can't park on my street one day, I can go a block over, and it's not that far away. But if I live on the middle of Putnam Street or School Street, it's. Uh, and those are that's a long walk, and it's the hill part. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I could yes. just park. I could, I could just park in front of Ben's house. So what we'll do is we'll. <laughs> We'll, we'll just punch Summit. We'll just punch Summit Ave through uh, through those houses. No, uh, no, no, that's that's obviously a, a big deal, and and I, I don't want to understate the, the the inconvenience or the stress that this puts on anybody. And and I think Deb, your street and Prescott Street, um, as well as Madison and Montrose, which are a little bit shorter and not as hilly, but they're long blocks that you can't cut over, and it, those are streets that it's it's very difficult, and you you know you might be asking people who can't walk that well to walk pretty far, and I think that's. Um, that's why, that's why it might make sense to assign people to certain streets so that you know people like me who can walk a bit more get thrown on Avon Street where there's plenty of parking and it's it's um, you know well I shouldn't say plenty of parking but more parking available than, than yeah you have to sort of effort reaching out to residents with limited mobility on uh, Putnam School mm -hmm. on the Union Square side of the hill um, to give them special permits or, sure. or HP placards. Yeah, I mean, there might, maybe there's a, a, a something that's not a, yeah, not an HP, but something else. Um, yeah, th there might be an elegant way to do that without allowing people to abuse that, but um, that's a good suggestion because those streets are challenging. Yes? Um, so just observations that I've made, I'm actually like two houses from City Hall on Madison. Okay. Um, and we're on the even side, and like we're the morning sun side. So like the last couple of years, the city's been a lot better about removing the snow, but it's always been an odd, odd parking, and it just takes forever to melt when it's on mm. our side because oh. it's not. Sunny. You is that that's the street we're on the south side. This is a big hill, right? There's like no driveways on this side, or am I thinking of of Madison? Of Madison? Um, I can't get, I can't get those streets right, but I know that there's one side of the street that has like I walked up all these staircases because I, I was flying. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. So to answer part of your question, yeah, this, we as as part of the this discussion last year, we've targeted all these streets, or at least the 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 the, 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 big, the bigger ones in terms of where parking demand is to remove snow um, after snowstorms. That's been part of the commitment that the city has already made. Um, that said, there's, you know, 
a hundred and something bus stops that have to be cleared out by the city. There's, there's the school lots that have to be cleared out by the city, parks and playgrounds and things like that. So it, it in addition to arterial streets that need to be widened uh, so that vehicles can move through. But So it's on the priority list. It's just not the top of the priority list to remove that snow. So um, we can push that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I go to the traffic, the traffic and parking commission, committee, commission meetings every month, and this has been a, a bit of a, a, a hot button lately in, in different parts of the city because we, we have a street where there's like three driveways on one side of the street and 15 on the other, and so they want to be able to put the parking on, keep the parking on the odd side every year or whatnot. Or whatnot. So the time they're they're considering <laughs> exceptions now. They they want to do a full year odd, full year even, and then because they didn't want you know everybody calls and mm -hmm. asks to get their tree exempted. Uh, now they're kind of taking a serious look at yeah. where it really makes sense. Street by street data. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there there's they're a couple listening. that really they're, stand out as yeah. kind of it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Just, there's so many strange idiosyncratic mm -hmm. streets in Somerville that right. there are just some where it doesn't. That said, I know that they, they don't want to do it for every, they, they want to make it somewhat predictable, right? And they also don't want to make, you know, they, they want to be careful not to, unless it's, unless it's an obvious choice, they don't want to take, you know, the decisions of the residents of this year that in, in, it might disadvantage the next, you know, group of people that move in or whatnot. So I'm uh, not saying it will definitely happen, uh, but it might be worth considering if that's truly an issue. Um, and there is like 15 more spaces on, on your street than on the even side versus the odd side. Um, so. Again, this is something that we're trying to get better at. Um, we but, can talk about that. After. Sure. <laughs> All right. um, I don't know if you, I did mention this already, but I did schedule tentatively a meeting in this room, March 11th um, at 6 p.m. Hope to have more info on the things we're trying to do to make it easier for folks, both residents and staff. Do you um, anticipate having the offsite lot proposals in by then? I truly hope so. Um, yes. I don't know if they'll be back, but if they're out, then I'll at least be able to say they're out, and by June I'll be able to, uh, I'll be able to give you an update. So. so when you were talking about the campus and you were talking about the spaces that were in front of City Hall, mm -hmm. will some of those be reserved for people that just need to pop in and out of City Hall to do business, like so, pay their taxes or whatever? Mm -hmm. So right now, so actually if you look at this, this is the, these are the spaces that are remaining, and right. those spaces are remaining as visitor spaces after a certain time. Uh, they become spaces for Board of Alderman members, which I think about half of you right. guys now arrive some other way, which is great. Um, you don't use those spaces, but my, um, my, uh, my guess, and I'm not, we, we haven't planned what we do with these spaces yet, but I'm thinking that almost all of the spaces in, in that concourse are going to be for some specialty use, like um, for visitor spaces or for um, you know, electric vehicle spaces or whatnot. So uh, I'd be pretty surprised if there was many spaces in that area that were just first come, first serve city staff. Might be wrong, but uh, there's so many different, you know, there's so many different considerations. We have six handicap spaces in that area right now. Those probably aren't moving. Um, those are the most convenient spaces for those. So um, you can imagine that there's enough for those specialty needs um, that need to be in, a, in an off-street lot that, yeah. Uh, so I, I, we haven't planned those up specifically, but I can't imagine that those visitor spaces would, would um, move too far, if at all. Yep. Um, I, I, so I went to the, the um, campus planning meeting, yeah. and there was, there was a drawing that I kind of seemed to show uh, crosswalks. Yep. With the sidewalks extending into mm -hmm. the street. And I was just curious if, if that's a, a, an actual plan or if that was just a pretty drawing because it kind of eats up parking. And yeah, yeah. So, what you're describing are uh, curb extensions that would shorten the crossing length and, and help make pedestrians more visible. Um, you're not supposed to park within 20 feet of an intersection, it happens. Um, and I'm guessing those bump outs in some cases are probably more than that 20 foot footprint. Um, so, I would it's likely that that might bite off of a space or two. And, and to answer your question, those are not, we're not far enough along in that design to, um, to make that, to take that into account. But once they are, we will make sure that is applied to the final number. Um, but there's a chance that Highland Ave will, will lose, you know, six or eight spaces because of those crosswalks, which Highland Ave is probably the most valuable parking spaces we have, because again, we can use the spaces along the campus for, um, you know, two hour parking or pickup drop off activity or, um, one thing that uh, one of uh, Lisa and our working group likes to mention is like, where do the visiting team buses park? Like Highland Ave could be that. Like that, there's all kinds of, the, of, of like secondary, uh, but specialty uses you could use Highland Ave for. So um, we don't want to lose too many of those spaces, but 
obviously the land is is valuable. Uh, the the right of way is valuable there. So and and we all know that it's tough to cross Highland Ave. Um, and so anything you can do to make it safer, especially if we're going to be asking people to cross it to get to and from their car, um, is is very important. So. Um, yeah. If you haven't looked at the Central Hill, uh, Hill Campus Planning Study uh, yet, I believe if you just type those words into um, into the Somerville MA search bar, you'll be able to, to see some cool options there. There's also the idea of making this part of School Street two way as part of that. Yes. Proposal, yeah. So which would also lose a certain amount of parking mm -hmm. on School Street. Yeah. So uh, I, this is not within the three year time frame necessarily, but um, we see that the, having this section of School Street between Highland and uh, Medford Street as two-way um, would have some mobility advantages, especially considering that's where the Green Line station is. Um, the 85 through there, and the 85. Yeah, now you're talking. Um, the 85 turns around on Avon Street, which doesn't make any sense. So we would we're trying to get the T to. We don't have a whole lot of north-south bus routes in the city, um, and so you can imagine that would be a big advantage if the uh, we were thinking actually Central Street, but potentially School Street, um, because I think this section of School Street is also on the table for when um, getting in the weeds here. But we want to make Somerville Ave two-way all the way through Union Square, so you don't have to go up Bow Street and back down again. Um, and in order to, in that way, we, w we can make Bow Street into a kind of a pedestrian street, or closer to a pedestrian street than it is now. But in order to do that, you need another way up the hill besides Walnut Street. So that means maybe School Street, or maybe you push people all the way to Central Street. So um, we're still figuring that stuff out, but all these things do have parking implications. and. I am reminding people not to go too far without uh, considering the parking impacts uh, on these streets because as you remove more of these spaces, it means pushing more people into the residential neighborhoods. Not that these aren't residential neighborhoods already, but um, they do have real you know, impacts to, to folks. So. We certainly have them in our, in our house, and we're a few blocks off Highland, but we have not noticed any impact yet. Okay. Where are you going? Uh, Summit Ave. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's been not a problem yet. So Yeah, so I, I think actually. Block. <laughs> yeah, so. That's, yeah, it's not one of the ones in red except for yeah. Green Street Sweeping, mm -hmm. so it's not. Yeah, we noticed Grand Union is pretty full, um, but yeah, it might just be, be the hills get tricky in that area, so there might be more driveways than on your street than on Grand Union or whatnot, so. Yeah. And the good thing about the survey data is that we, we ask people for their streets, so if yeah. we notice that, you know, your street's not uh, pretty light and somebody else is pretty heavy, then we can compare those. Although most of our responses are from Putnam and Vinyl and uh, Prescott and uh, Montrose and Madison. So I might have to do a fresh round of flyering for that for your neighborhood. Uh, make sure more of your neighbors have seen the survey. Cool. It's a lot that's going to disappear for the soccer field. Mm -hmm. That uh, part of the high school is going to become part of City Hall. Right. So, this that you're talking about the 1895 building, yeah. which I don't think I have a good picture of it, um, which is essentially like this building. Um, yeah, it's essentially this building. Uh, okay. This part of the high school that like, going That's away. That's going to be a high school still. This, the one you just touched. Yeah, this. Yeah. So like. Is right. There that's yeah, be that's any still there. Access yeah. at that lot because don't they process a lot of like. I know that like they're trash. I, I should have brought a future condition here, but um, my understanding is that there will be a access road that does something like this uh -huh. and back out again, and that'll be adjacent to the field. Um, I don't know what the hours of that are. It's supposed to be a pedestrian area except for when they need it, so it'll be gated for when it'll be blocked off until people need to get at the trash barrel and stuff like that. But it's a back of house access towards their loading area. So yeah. um, that they'll be that'll be access from School Street, which is another reason why we might want to consider two-way School Street because you, then you just have less trucks going a weird way to get to that area. Um, so um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point. But to answer your first question, the 1895 building is remaining. My understanding is that the city hopes to renovate that and add city offices there. Um, there'll be additional uh, hoops to jump through in terms of zoning for that, but. Um, that's the plan because we're running out of room at City Hall and we need more staff. So mm -hmm. and by running out of room, I mean we're well out of room. <laughs> so. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Alderman. Um, transportation at summervillema.gov uh, gets to me and my boss and my other my coworker. You can also take a card if you want one. Um, otherwise, 
You can find that stuff on the website starting next week. There's already a bunch of stuff on the website, so uh, just search for SHS Parking on Somerville, on Somerville's website, and you can find all that stuff. But um, I will aim to hold that meeting in March, um, unless there's any kind of scheduling snags, and I'll update the website as soon as I can if I do. So. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.